And so, yeah, everybody's not going to have a great chance to introduce himself. Jesse's with the Midwest Assistance Program. He's part of our team that's working on the private well program. Uh, he sets up workshops and does workshops for sanitarians and well owners, as well as does assessments in a bunch of states. And so when you get up here. I don't want to do this. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so go. Go. <laughs> All right, well, I'm Jesse Campbell. I'm with Midwest Assistance Program, and uh, this is one of the issues that I've had the pleasure of being called in to help out with uh, over the last year in last year's funding. And since I can't see the slides changing behind me, it's gonna be really annoying. Oh, there we go. All right. <laughs> um, color form's been covered a lot already during this conference. I have some slides in here over it. I'm not gonna talk about it. Uh, what, we, what I am gonna talk about is four wells that were testing positive over about a mile area. Um, so I'm going to skip the coliform portions. <laughs> They're all new wells. They've been drilled recently. And so there was an issue. Um, it was a persistent coliform problem. So that's what we're going to be talking about. And I just decided to skip these. There we go. Um, the, the call was from the sanitarian Gina Bell uh, in Kansas. Uh, They're in the Newton area. And she was having a problem with these wells that you see flagged on this map here. They go about across about a mile, mile and a half area there, and they were all testing polygenative for coliform bacteria. Um, up front, we knew that uh, the wells had coliform. They were, the coliform was traveling kind of northwest to southeast. Uh, they were all new wells. They're all grouted appropriate to the state codes. Um, the septic systems in the area were functioning properly. And so I asked myself, can this actually happen? What's, what's going on here? I've always been told coliform filters out in about 100 feet. It shouldn't be there. Um, so I was really having a hard problem trying to help out with this problem that she was having. So I went to the CDC and e EPA websites, uh, took a little bit of time to look into those. And basically, they're very vague. They say, yeah, it can happen if the right, right uh, conditions are present. So if all of this stuff's present, you can have this problem. And that's not really a very good answer. So I went out and looked for some professional help. <clears throat> so through looking for professional help, I found myself uh, calling Pam Chafee with the uh, Kansas Health and Environment, KDHE, there we go, Health and Environment. Um, she was able to help me out a lot. She pointed me at some maps, and we spent about two or three hours on the phone looking at uh, all these topographical maps and such. She showed me where there's a watershed going down the uh, eastern side and the watershed going down the western side of this area. And those blue dots you see there in the middle are some of the wells. Uh, we took a look at the well logs to see what the geology was in the area. Luckily, we were able to find well logs for all the wells that we were looking at. Um, and this is just some of the geology. As you can see, there's a shale layer down below where they're trying to get their water. Most of the people are trying to get their water from that sand and gravel aquifer. Uh, when Pam finally pointed me to an aerial view and said, well, what about this? This kind of looks funky over here on this side of this aerial map of the area. Um, that's when we started to kind of investigate and try to determine what was going on. Um, so some more detective work was necessary. Went back out to the area, asked a whole bunch more questions, uh, find out that all the septic systems are great, find out that the wells are put together correctly, find out that they've shock chlorinated several numerous times over the last year trying to get rid of this problem. Um, learned from the, the county and from Pam that there's some additional factors. There was a drought in the area for the previous years, and it's been an extremely heavy rainfall this year that I'm working on this. Uh, so the aquifer is recharging quicker, and they've added a whole lot more new wells to the area. All those wells, like I said, are brand new wells out across there. Um, so when we zoomed into that aerial map, um, that map we were looking at earlier, you can see that there's some ponds over there on that uh, western watershed that goes around the outside of that formation. Those are actually dug man-made ponds, and the direction of the coliforms coming from those ponds. Um, something else we learned while we were thinking about the ponds and while I was digging around in the area is that they're losing ponds. They have drilled a well beside the ponds, and they fill the ponds with the well. So they're just kind of recycling the water down into the ground and back up into the pond and back, you know, so on and so forth. Okay. So that's part of our hypothesis is maybe the coliform is coming from this direction, um, going out across the formation. And there we go. Uh, so <laughs> our hypothesis continued groundwater under the influence, under the direct influence. Um, they removed an aquitard when they went in there and dug them ponds, more than likely. And since that stream liked to go out around the formation and take the water that direction, now they're pulling it up all there. Um, additional factors, the extra wells in the area are pulling water that direction across the formation. The drought left the aquifer depleted and it's trying to recharge quickly. And maybe in years that it's dry without the abnormal rainfall, they may not have this problem anymore when it all works out. And why is it a hypothesis and not facts? 
Uh, first of all, there's not enough information. Um, there was a property up there in the upper northwest corner. He had tested positive a couple of years before, but he won't let anybody come back on a test anymore. And he put up a nice little gate and won't let you on his land. Um, so the outcome, uh, I was able to educate well owners. I was able to provide the local sanitarian with additional assistance so that she could educate uh, those people better and provide a little bit of information over to KDHE, which I have her down as Kansas Geological Survey. So. <sighs> So what I forgot to mention is that there's a single sheet in here that says Lightning Talks on it. So you should write your questions down on that. So when we get at the end, we can ask the questions of our, of our folks who are speaking. So um, Lisa Lehman from Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Good afternoon. I'm Lisa Lehman with the Private Water Supply Section at the Wisconsin DNR. And I'm going to be talking to you about how we're helping people find well construction reports. So it's springtime in Wisconsin. Uh, the flowers are blooming, the birds are singing, deer fawn are being born, and fishermen are fishing. Um, we've all noticed that the economy is starting to improve. And so we're seeing for sale signs show up in yards. And people are starting to think about buying a home. And sometimes when they look for property, they discover that the property is served by a private well. When someone learns that, a buyer particularly learns that a property is served by a private well, they have a lot of questions. They want to know how deep the well is, how was it constructed, where is that water coming from, is that water going to be safe to drink? And so what they often will do is call DNR, and they have all these questions for us. The number one question they typically ask us is, can you help me find my well construction report for this property that I'm looking for? You might be familiar with Wisconsin for the wonderful outdoor recreation that we have uh, for the world famous Green Bay Packers and of course cheese. Um, if you listen closely to Kevin's talk earlier, then you'll also know that more than a quarter of our population gets its drinking water from private wells. And we estimate anywhere between 800,000 and a million private wells in Wisconsin. That's a lot of wells. And when rural properties go up for sale, that's a lot of phone calls to our staff. And people are looking for their well construction reports. We get a lot of calls, and it's a big workload. We started to think about, well, why are we getting so many calls? We have a searchable online database. Anybody can access it 24-7. All you have to do is type in this very simple web address <laughs> and um, to get started. So, we started digging into this a little bit more, and we realized really the, the number one problem is that our internet navigation is just, it's too hard for people. We haven't made it easy enough. Um, they don't know where to look. There's too many clicks. They don't know how to search, um, or sometimes they don't get a result. And then when you multiply this by the number of people that are involved in any given property transaction, we get calls from the realtor, the lender, the buyer, the seller, the inspector. So we came up with four approaches to make this uh, easier on us. Make it easier for the people that are looking, make it obvious, explain how to search, and then let people know what we've done. So number one, we've made it easier. Keyword, wells. It's easy to explain to people. It's easy for people to remember. So you don't have to type in a long URL. Second, make it obvious. We've got the big yellow button now, find well construction report. So this is featured prominently on our Wells webpage. Bright yellow, so you'll see in the next screen um, our Wells webpage. The button is featured prominently to the right. We actually have it on several of our pages so that if people are searching in different ways, um, they'll come across it. Third, we want to help explain, make it easier to use our databases. Most of our databases are obvious to us, but not necessarily to everybody. So we created a tips document for how to use our searchable databases. Again, it's featured prominently on the page. And we've got step-by-step -step instructions for how to use the databases, answers to frequently asked questions, and also links to other DNR web pages that a private well owner might be interested in. Last but not least, an email address to contact us so if they try all these and they get stuck, they can contact us and get help. 
So our fourth strategy is just to tell people about the changes that we've made. So we announced our webpage updates to licensed drillers, county regulators, state realtors association, and they sent it out to all their members. So the results for us are we're getting fewer calls, the calls don't take as long, and we get to focus our time on inspecting new wells under construction, which is our top priority. The results for our customers, we believe, are that they're finding the well information more quickly, the property transactions are moving forward, and that makes everybody happy. So the next things we plan to do are look at some of the other frequently asked questions that we get by phone and email, look at web analytics, and figure out other ways that we can make it easier and make it obvious for people to find information about private wells. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is Jason Barrett from Mississippi State University Extension. So there you go, it's all yours. You stand up there, he's gonna start it. Hello, it is fantastic to be here. Uh, yes, as Steve said, I'm Jason Barrett with MSU Extension. Um, how this all began for me is, I think in either 13 or 14, someone from the private well class actually called Mississippi State and said, hey, we're, willing, we're interested in doing some things in Mississippi and getting some interaction. So it, it got turned towards me, and with any, like any good extension person, I started trying to find where are our private well people. So as you can see in the outline, we'll touch on that. First thing I actually did was went into uh, the process of trying to figure out where our private well populations are located. So we created a publication, and the methodology will be in the next slide here, talking about how we actually figured out uh, in our best estimate where the private well populations are located using uh, MSDH, which records the state health department, the drinking water systems, and census data of populations. On top of that, we started looking at some USGS numbers um, to determine which are commercial and which are non-commercial. And what came out of that is we really had 65 counties that showed um, large populations. And initially, I categorized them by percentage, but then the second time we did the publication, we changed it to actual populations. So as you can see, one to 3,000, three to 10, and over 10. And as you can see, the, the location, we have a, a, a spot in North Mississippi, Central Mississippi, and South Mississippi, which are our target areas. So this is where we really wanted to start focusing the attention to point people to the private well class. And then with that, we started actually doing some, some programs of our own. And in order to do that, we needed good information that we put out. So one of the first publications that I did was uh, called Protecting Your Private Well. Uh, and as you see, it's just a general overview of private wells, because at the point in time when I started, there was not a lot of publications that MSU Extension had put out. Uh, second was the actual self-assessment, and this is a process that homeowners can actually walk through, Q&A themselves, and kind of see if they have a high or low, medium um, issues at their home, at their private well. Uh, moving on, we actually started doing some videos and actually started doing some sampling at people's homes. Uh, one thing, I do like interactive so that people can actually go and, and watch a video rather than just read something. So we actually created a video on how to collect a water sample. So instead of just having the, the, the tangible in front of you, an individual can watch this video and it follows right along with the, our exact bottles, process, procedure, everything, so that uh, we hopefully have accurate samples that are not contaminated in any way. Moving on down, started uh, created another publication talking strictly about bacteriologicals so that customers, once they got their results back, they could interpret those and know what they actually had, uh, which of course y'all know that leads into wastewater systems, so it created another publication, uh, self-assessment, people can walk through that again, asking the questions they can see if they have issues with their septic system or not. Um, we have moved further. Uh, this publication actually I did with the uh, Texas A&M contingency that is here. This was fantastic. Uh, I literally just took their publication, pulled out things that referenced Texas, and we put in things that referenced Mississippi. Uh, a great piece of that was an actual figure that shows a well being constructed by Mississippi codes. Texas had one, and I started working with our MDEQ, and hey, they did not have one, so we created one. This figure actually follows all the codes of Mississippi's well construction. Uh, also, poultry is the number one ag uh, commodity in Mississippi, and as you would think, uh, they need water, so we actually had a lot of poultry questions that started coming, so I worked with a poultry specialist to create that publication, uh, which leads into 
uh, programs that we actually host for private well owners where they can come, have their private well screened, and we also have a workshop. Uh, Steve with the private well class has been phenomenal. He's helped me on every one of those. This is a picture of one we had in South Mississippi. Uh, and you'll see in a second from the numbers, we usually average a little over 20, uh, some a little larger, some a little smaller, but, but in all we average somewhere between 20 and 30 people per class, which has been fantastic. Uh, we've had wait, eight workshops in five counties. Uh, just about all of them have been at our MSU Extension offices. Uh, Soil and Water Conservation District in Kapai County partnered with me on the last one we did. Uh, we've had 184 attendees in those, and as you can see, We've had uh, two in Marshall County, one in, in Lowndes, uh, two in Kapai, two in Pearl River, and one in Harrison. We have another one in Harrison planned for next month. So we're staying active. It's been good. Uh, the numbers that I'm seeing as far as results are very similar to what I've seen with many of y'all showing results. About 65% are absent, about 35% present for total coliform. We've had a, a right at 4% E. coli positive that we've seen. And again, those are kind of consistent numbers I'm seeing across the states. There is my contact information. This has been fantastic. <laughs> All right, great job, Renee. So our next speaker is Renee Rickard. She's with the Tuscarora Nation, and she's the environmental director, as I recall. Close? Yeah. yeah. All right. So, in New York. So I just want to say um Twentness Twentness gonna have Nat Nadu Hatna Kiatha Hijata Gehas, a Gisa Sita Ujira, Wakdena Skarura Ekohewa Gayadakre, Wakutna Skarura Afnaweta Udaya Hakana Hirata. Some of the Renee, I'm from the Tuscar Nation and I work for the Tuscar Environment Office. Um, the history about the Tuscar people is we were originally in North Carolina and there were supposed to be some pictures dropping in. I don't know if they're happening. So we originated in North Carolina. Um, we had what was called the Tuscarora Wars with North Carolina and the state of South Carolina. And um, we followed the right roots of peace and settled with the Haudenosaunee or the Iroquois Confederacy, um, probably around 1720. Presently, the Tuscarora Nation is about nine miles outside of um, Niagara Falls, New York. We are a, we are a um, matrilineal nation. We have traditional, a traditional government. Um, we have no casinos, we have no nation businesses, and we have no BIA funding. So I don't know what happened. Keep, yeah. yeah, we'll just keep going. I'm Can you push the button okay. for you? There Here you they go. are. Yeah. So this is the original map, and um, you know we have about 5,900 acres. We lost 550 acres to the New York Power Authority, and we have about 350 homes and about 1,000 in population. So currently we have about maybe 250 residents on a well system. Um, we have bulk purveyors. Um, we have um, a lot of people that buy their water for drinking. Um, some of the geology of the nation is we are on the Niagara Escarpment. So all of our surface and groundwater moves away from us. Um, some of our issues are we have um, death to bedrock is about two foot in some areas. We have clay about three or four feet in other areas. So we have some limited, very interesting um, issues at Tuscarora for sure when we're trying to install septics and wells. Um, the soil and the clay, you know, during droughts, People's wells go by. Um, the Lockport Dolanite is very hard and salty. Um, and then in some areas, we just cannot provide any water to households. Um, some of our own documented stuff is um, definitely we have had spills on our nation territory. We have 14 unregulated gas stations on our territory. We have a teepees dump site that was um, has some steel slag. Um, and we have our own houses that just do not have properly constructed septics and they don't maintain them. Um, some of them are very old. So, you know, trying to protect our groundwater with these issues going on is a little bit um, hard. We have done sampling through the Tuscarora Environment Office. We've done probably seven at least sampling events. We also participated, which I didn't list on there, was a groundwater study put on by the New York Power Authority during their relicensing process. Um, the latest round of um, sampling would be um, in 2012, and if you can see on the side, the very far, whatever side that is, the IHS study, we sampled 139 homes and 22% of them came back with E. coli. 
Other issues is VOCs. Um, definitely um, one of the New York Power Authority monitoring wells had um, 160 micrograms per liter of um, benzene, and it was out in the middle of nowhere. Like we were in a field, there was no houses, there was no industry. We also have lead issues for houses, and from the 2012 sampling, you can see that 14 out of the 15 wells tested positive for lead, and we were only allowed to do a certain amount due to funding, so we couldn't sample all the residents for lead. Um, some secondary issues for sure are, um, you know, the TDS is really high, and, and I just learned about the, cor um, the corrosive of the you know, corrosive water. I didn't really understand that until I listened to the well driller, drillers yesterday, and I understand it now. Um, some of the things that the Environment Office is really trying to do is educate our own people because that's the only mechanism we do have in place. We are not an enforcement agency whatsoever. So we do do yearly education for our people about maintaining their septic and wells. We do work with the Indian Health Service now to get um, properly constructed wells for homeowners, but it is an application process. So if um, you can't prove you own the land to the nation, then most of the time they don't get a well. And that it goes for the septics too. We have the septic system replacement through the Indian Health Service. And so if it's the same process. Um, but we do try to also build relationships and I have had one with a um, really good septic tank pumper. And so they give us a group rate. So if I can get 10 households, they'll give us a discount. Um, and then the last thing we're doing is community water planning. Um, we are surrounded by the town of Lewiston, and they um, are eager to put water lines through the nation, but we're kind of like, where do we go? You know, our, if you see that, our, in 2004, our community was pretty split, 50-50, on whether we wanted public water or not. So we're not sure where we're going. Do we continue doing what we're doing? Do we just install treatment for households, or do we move to community water? Thank you. Yeah, it's a tough spot. The geology is really vulnerable there. It's, uh, yeah. Uh, so Cindy Brooks from uh, WSOS, which is also uh, Great Lakes RCAP to me, um, is going to talk about some of the well assessments she's been involved in. Oh, I should be good. Good afternoon. I'm Cindy Brooks. Um, I, I'm going to give you a snapshot view, some photos, and some concerns that we hear while we do well assessments throughout the Great Lakes um, RCAP area. Um, I'm Cindy Brooks, as I said. I've been working in partnership with Tom Fishball from our region as well. And um, starting when we return in June 1st, Tom's going to be leaving me and leaving me with the full Great Lakes RCAP area, uh, which you can see um, we have focused our efforts in Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, and Ohio with this year adding the Wisconsin, state of Wisconsin due to some issues that have been brought to our attention occurring up there. So never, we don't always understand what we see, but this is what we see, a sand point in a pit. We're never quite sure, but I think from the looks of it, it was based on need for repair and then concern that they wouldn't be able to get to it again. Hand pumps are always a concern, and this one was a little scarier than most, what making me wonder, uh, what is this homeowner drinking, and um, what can we do to help them? So that was a really big focus on that assessment. Hand dug wells worked with a community that had mainly hand dugs. The one on the um, left, or your, I don't know. <laughs> the encased one is in a basement. The other one is out in a yard, but these are all surface water, very surface water influenced. Sand points um, seem to be a commonality in Indiana, a little bit in Illinois and Michigan, slightly in Ohio. This is a, one of the better ones that we see because it's actually marked and we know where to find it. Pitted wells are still out there. This one is one of the nicer ones we can say. It's covered nicely, and then the inside is cl uh, cleaner than mo most of what we see out there. Usually there's much more um, involved. The sealed well, this one was a very interesting one. The homeowner's afraid to open it, not sure what they're going to find. And with the date of 1945, I'm not sure what to advise them they would find. So that was a challenge with that well. Some of the things that we hear when we're out there, there's concerns about cancer clusters, arsenic pockets are becoming more common, fracking is definitely one that we get, 
um, that there's landfills nearby, concerns about agriculture, the pesticides and fertilizers. This was an interesting well. The homeowner brought it to the casing to the surface because they found out that was the code, but they don't want to give up the pit. So we're questioning if it's pitless or pointless. So. <laughs> Uh, this one is very interesting. I wish I had the initial picture of about eight stones stacked on top of the um, well lid, a casing lid there, and then the frayed uh, conduit. And when I talked to the homeowner about it, she just didn't understand what was wrong with that concept. Always interesting to find what is guarding the well. Uh, many times I run across pets, dogs, cats. Um, but the goat was a very interesting decorative um, guard um, hiding this well. So, and then broken casings do tend to be a problem. Uh, the dog was guarding the, a broken casing based on purchase. The other one, I have to advise not to learn to use the zero turn mo mower around the well casing. Um, hidden wells. Many times they're hidden in landscaping, planting, um, or under faux rocks. And the faux rocks also provide questioning on what you're going to find under that rock. It can be anything from any critter you can name. And then the, the hidden, based on the camouflage well in the flower bed so that you couldn't find it, was a real popular one in a, a one section as well. Um, this was interesting, a sanitarian that knows the code, but wanted the um, extension, the house addition, where it went, didn't care, we won't hurt the well, was the, was the common um, answer there. This is uh, the scariest one. Um, it was under, once I figured out what it was with Steve's help, it's a Pressure tank underground with pitless, and it freezes often. That's what the bales, and then there, that was a cover, the orange piece over it. Then there's always the infamous, where is your well? Oh, it's somewhere out there. Well, somewhere out there, there's a rainbow, too, is my thought always. So I, I'm always a little scared with these. Then there's the well that's the well. So you find all kinds of decorative coverings, but the, the most common, it seems like, is the well covering of the well casing. And that concludes my presentation. So I talk about partners all the time. I didn't solve her problem with the underground uh, pressure tank. I called Mark Layton, and uh, he's, he's seen it before, and uh, he got back to Cindy and helped her solve that. So it's all who you know, right? Okay, our next speaker is Tom Christofferson. Um, uh, yeah, talking about proper well maintenance. It's all yours. You know that guy he talked about that didn't prepare? <laughs> Hang on, we're going for a ride. I want to talk to you why maintenance is important. And maintenance has a couple different faces. You know, we all think about repairing the pump and repairing the well. But let's talk about maintenance in the whole water system or maybe maintaining the groundwater itself. Total coliforms are a problem. They're not necessarily harmful, but we use them as a good indicator. They tell us if the system has been open or not and if we have system integrity. <clears throat> in our state, we had four distinct purposes of our act, and you can see them there, there. They're to protect, 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 and provide. Um, our drillers are required to submit well logs to the owner and to the state. So we have that authority. These are our chapters of our regulations that um, require those drillers to maintain logs, to maintain that relationship. Uh, we have uh, four chapters. One of them is our nuts and bolts of our uh, constructions. But our biggest struggle is illegal water wells. Um, as you most can tell, out of sight, out of mind. People get a well drilled and they just walk away from the old one. Maybe they say they want to use it later. Maybe they want to keep it. Or they don't get any water. And we see open boreholes anywhere from four inches to the one on the right. It's a 36 inch borehole that was over 360 foot deep. My inspector stepped on the board and the board went down the hole. Or we see um, environmental wells. Uh, people think because it's in a surface contamination or it's a place where they're cleaning it up, they don't have to really maintain it, put the proper stick ups in there. Or you don't have to grout them properly. You can drill them right through the cement and leave your well there, put a cover over it, but what you're really doing is recycling. 
Yeah, you're pulling the contaminant out. Rain comes, washes it right back in. Um, locations, a key portion of our, um, our regulations. You don't want to be on, at least 100 feet from any contaminant. That big poop pile there next to the irrigation well is not a good idea. And normally what happens is we drill a well and then they expand the feedlot that comes closer to the well. Oh, here's some of those interactive videos. Look at this. This is great, neat cement. This is what I was talking about yesterday. And this is a microannulus. Um, oh, poop. <laughs> it cut it off. What you were seeing was water passing between the casing and the well. Now here we're seeing a grout failure. This is where cement is blown right through a chip seal grout has gone into an aquifer and cracked. So maintenance um, is, a, is a, you know, a subjective word. This is a little bit of what I talked about yesterday on the, on the videos. You can see where the contaminant goes right around the protective covers, right around the grout, goes past the um, confining layers and contaminates your aquifer. The best maintenance here is to perforate those old wells and try to reestablish that clay layer. When we do that, then we separate those aquifers again and we've maintained that integrity of the groundwater. Or you can bore along the side of it and try to inject grout into that borehole to separate those things. Um, we've discovered in our studies that we can't seal a well because the surface area is not sealable. If it was, we wouldn't have groundwater. We have to work with the, the mother nature aspect of it and use that filtration system and uh, reestablish that. So here's things that every well owner should have. You should know the legal location of your well, what it's made in, the depth and diameter of the hole, total depth of the casing, uh, static water level, pumping water level, who drilled it, his license number, the date it began, intended use of the well, and the well owner's name and address. And if you do have water quality results, do a baseline. These are all things that are required in Nebraska because one year we're dealing with floods where we've had uh, water over the top of our wells in, in 2011. The next year we've had um, other challenges one Mississippi, two Mississippi. Yeah, <laughs> next year it's range fires. You know, with all those floods and all that water, we got a lot of good um, subgrowth, and then we get a drought and we get range fires. Now you can see on the left, why well, we like to have steel through the frost zone. Um, plastic just does not hold up. All right, next we have Ginger Davis, who's with Hamilton County Soil and Water Conservation District in Indiana, which I learned last night. Thanks. A lot of Hamilton County. So oh, yeah, yeah. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. You guys ready? All right. So I typically do conservation plans for natural resources for our community, our county in Indiana. Um, but we started a new program to tailorize testing and uh, give them answers to our local well owners. So this is kind of the process I go through when I am talking to a new well owner and trying to determine what information to give them about their private well. The goals is very important. So the goals of, of what they're trying to do with that water is going to determine uh, what kind of recommendations and what kind of tests I, I suggest they have. Um, you know, are those goals for safe drinking water or are they for agricultural purposes? Are they trying to um, water their livestock? So the first thing I always do is suggest a well assessment and Cindy Brooks is my go-to for that. She provides us a well assessment to give us local influences and well and plumbing conditions and construction information. I found that the well assessments are really, really valuable when we're talking to the owners about their historical knowledge of what's gone on in that area. Um, their information of, of what happened 50 years ago a lot of times influences what we suggest and recommend. So the, um, uh, the whole point is to determine what kind of risk these individuals are at based on their local influences. So we use some of the assessments like from Oregon State to determine what risk level people are at. Um, and we also provide this if they don't want to do the in-home assessment. Uh, 
I can't express enough how much working with partners has been a big part of this project and how we use that partnership to, to determine um, what we should be recommending and, and where, where we need to go with that. Uh, health department and well, local well drillers have been a big help. Um, so here's where I come in, gathering information. I feel like I'm back in college, right? USGS has some pesticide data that's uh, estimated county by county. I use that to determine what the local pesticides are, spill records, all that kind of research. So then we get into the analysis. What do they test for? Well, there are thousands of indicators. So it's really hard to come up with a small suite of things. And, and what kind of tests do we do? Do we use the litmus paper or do we use cabbage to determine pH? All right, just kidding. So what methodologies are we gonna use? Um, and, and how does that affect our human health and, and, and when does that come in, uh, into play? Human health protection is kind of the goal uh, with a lot of our, pro our project. Um, and these are some of those analysts of concern for human health, right? So we could be the evil scientist and, and go in there and test everything, but is that realistic? Um, so, uh, in Indiana, at least, we do not have any requirements for private well drinkers, right? But there's 88 standards out there from EPA, um, 15 of those being the secondary for cosmetic effects and, and other uh, technical plumbing and that sort of thing. So we're trying to balance between what types of tests to suggest. Uh, the advanced one, um, looking at the pros and cons, advanced being more baseline but would help people further in the area. Um, but a lot of people, financial consideration is important and so that tiered approach. So we recommend testing with a bunch of disclaimers. Um, based on the tiered approach, a lot of times because of budgetary concerns, but also indicating what risk people are at for the, those different options and suggesting add-ons um, as things come back. So here's kind of a report of our tailored test program uh, that we provide. Um, this is just a template. It doesn't have very much information at this point in this one. Uh, but it does give why are we concerned, what should we test for, and, and where you can go from there. So here's where I become the interpreter, right? So we get those test results in, and I tell them, I use the words concern. This is where we have a concern about your test results um, and what next steps you can take to address those concerns. So here are some of those reports that are provided, um, well logs, test results. I use the Penn State Susan, thank you very much for the interpretation tool, um, to give me an idea of what, what to look at and what to recommend to people. Um, I also make recommendations for educational purposes of yearly follow-up, um, analyzing risk based on currents. Uh, arsenic's been brought up a lot, right? Redox reactions really determine a lot about arsenic. So if it gets dry, suddenly you're in a different environment. Anyway, so I also do, uh, recommend treatment, and uh, I'm going to use uh, Pierce's tool now, uh, but I've been going to the National Sanitary Foundation for their uh, recommendation for different types of filters. Biggest point out of this is that we do a lot of education. We are trying to protect the natural resources um, concerns and human health concerns for our community, but also for our natural resources and doing protection. So that's our program. Thanks. You don't want this? No. Oh, then you get it later. I'm just giving you a hard time. So yeah, there you go. So uh, stormwater conservation districts, at least in Indiana and Illinois, offer cost share programs for abandoning wells. And I'm not, I'm not know what counties that necessarily do that, but that's one of the great services they provide. So our next speaker is Jennifer Fetter from Penn State Extension talking about reaching homeowners through youth programs. Yeah. Hi. We've had a lot of fun kind of poking holes in Pennsylvania's lack of policies, but that's fine because um, what I'm going to talk to you about is trying to have some fun while learning and trying to reach some homeowners too. And so um, Susan pointed out earlier, and we've talked a little bit today about um, Pennsylvania's unique issues and our lack of regulations. And we're fortunate, I think, because of that, that we've had some sustained funding over the years and our partners that have kind of helped us to provide educational programs. and. Um, so we use these three partners, uh, well, our own network and those two funders to help us try some new things. And um, so you've seen this slide already today. Susan showed you this morning. We have um, over a million, about, about 
10% of the wells in the country are in Pennsylvania, and uh, that's fun for us. And Susan showed you her good, bad, and uglies too this morning. I swapped out the dog for the mouse in the well there. Um, the rest of the pictures are the same as what you saw this morning, but we definitely have some serious issues because um, we are, have, I laugh when I hear somebody say, uh, get the license number for your well driller, because we don't license our well drillers. And, um, Susan said to, you know, most of our wells have never been tested. About 45% of the wells in Pennsylvania have never been properly tested. And then what you see there are some of the big issues that our wells uh, fail in standards when they are tested. So we're always looking for new approaches. So how many of you have little agents of change running around your homes? Yes, good. Come on, I only have 15 seconds. Raise your hands, right? <laughs> So um, we were trying to look for new ways to reach homeowners, and um, nothing's better at shaming parents than kids coming home and pointing out all the things they're doing wrong. Um, this is how we started recycling in the United States, is it not? Um, and of course, uh, we're extension, and so we're rooted um, in our 4-H youth programs, and the 4-H youth program started because adults are stubborn, and they don't like to change, and they don't want to learn new things. But kids have an open mind, right? So for every person you've said, well, I've been drinking that water since I was a kid, Kid, we have to teach them now to stop drinking that water so they're not saying that in 20 and 30 years. So we uh, developed a program to get kids to learn some chemistry stuff, right? So it meets up with the standards they're supposed to be learning in school. Um, but also um, to get them to take some of that information home to their parents and get some action. We went around the state and did some programs in both in-school classrooms, but also with non-traditional groups and after-school groups like 4-H programs and scout groups. Um, there's very few of us, so we can only get so many of these done. The program basically looks like this. We give them some pre-class activity. The teacher or the club leader hands out this really cool resource we have that's designed for middle school to high school kids, teaches them about both public and private drinking water supplies, because not every group can have all kids with private supplies. They read about that, then we go into their classroom or to their group, have a first class visit where they get a presentation and they learn about water supplies and what groundwater is and where their water comes from. We try to tell them a little bit about their own community. And then we also teach them in that class about how to collect a water sample, what they um, can do at home because in our second class, we're actually going to test water from their homes in the class. They're going to do the testing themselves. So again, this is not a laboratory certified thing. There's lots of opportunity for mistakes, but they're learning. They're doing their own tests. Um, they're having a lot of fun. They're getting things that the teachers need to get done in the classroom anyway um, as part of this process. Um, so we test for pH total dissolved solids, nitrate, and hardness, just to give them a little bit of a well-rounded picture of some of the basic things um, that can help what we call serve as red flags. These are the same things we test for, generally speaking, when we do an adult program too, and we're testing for free on the fly right there at the program. We don't do bacteria with kids. Um, we do that with adults. We don't do it with the kids. Um, part of that is because we can't give them instantaneous results, and it's really easy for them to contaminate results when they're collecting at home. The other thing is too, there can be some embarrassment situations if a kid's result comes back positive and everyone else in the class sees that they're not going to handle that as well as adults might. And so we leave that out of the equation, but we do send some information home to the parents. So this is the result sheet they get, has some interpretation, what they should be getting. They're supposed to take that home, show their parents, and then we actually give this evaluation form. We encourage with the schools, especially the teachers actually kind of grade that this comes back. The kids write down what they learned. The parents at the bottom say, yes, I did see the results or I didn't. And yes, I'm planning on doing something about it or I'm not based on what the kids brought home to them. So we have fun. I'm just encouraging you to think about some innovative audience approaches, ways to get in touch with your homeowners somehow differently. Um, we actually focus on youth water education quite a bit at Penn State Extension. We've been trying to create some really great resources and opportunities. So Susan gave you our website earlier today, but there it is again. If you didn't catch it, it's going to be gone in 10 seconds. But um, we have a whole section on youth water education, some really good resources. Um, and we do have a biannual conference called Dive Deeper. If you're really into youth water education, uh, let me know and I'll hook you up on our mailing list. We have a great time with that. So thank you so much. Uh-oh. I wasn't ready for this. No. So uh, the one thing I've noticed about Pennsylvania is how active of a volunteer type network, even the League of Women Voters, the REN newsletter, all those things, because you don't have those regs, I think others have stepped up and it's more grassroots. And so we see a lot more of that kind of stuff coming out of Pennsylvania than anywhere else. So it's pretty cool. 
All right, do I have to do anything here? I'm just curious, okay. I, I'm more than willing. All right, uh, so, got through me here. Uh, this is Ann Imes, okay, um, from Criterion Water Labs, LLC, and talking about educating the community about drinking water. All right. Good. Yes, sir, thank you. Um, I'm owner of a private lab in Kokomo, Indiana, which is about an hour north of uh, Indianapolis. My husband was going to lose his job, we thought, with the auto industry, so we were trying to figure out what to do. Our well, our well driller said he had to take samples about an hour, and there was no uh, certified lab in our county, so that's how we ended up uh, doing this in 2009. <laughs> right. So education is my passion, it's what I've always done my whole life, and so it kind of natural now with the water industry, just to learn as much as I can and pass it on to whoever else needs it. So when people come in our lab, we have home inspectors, of course, we have almost anybody buying a home now. So we've been learning a lot. So here's uh, rivers in Indiana. Uh, our county is called Howard County, which is uh, kind of north central right there. And so you see there's some rivers, and our city takes water out of the Wildcat Creek. That's how Indiana American Water supplies Kokomo, Indiana, besides some wells. Uh, unfortunately, some wells that they draw water from. Uh, vinyl chloride was found um, about 2009 came public last year, so of course a big alert for everybody. 300 acres of groundwater is um, contaminated under the city of Kokomo and then spreading northeast. And so we have been monitoring some private wells outside that plume that was designated by the um, uh, uh, EPA. This is our bedrock, and that's what my model up here shows. The bedrock is... Um, what that's, there's one aquifer of bedrock. So I had a student that was in the Army with the Indiana University of Kokomo. We've had about eight students work for us. And so he actually built this model. And then we put the aquifers as puzzle pieces on top, on top of the bedrock. So it's color coded by the aquifers that are part of our system. And so we were trying to figure out. And so he, he was excellent. He got his biology degree. This is the map, we st or the diagram we started off from the Department of Natural Resources. And then we were able to just, he talked to a state geologist and he talked to Ortman, uh, a geologist with one of our well drillers, and was able to actually produce this map. He made cross sections of our county to show. Um, and so a lot of our wells are in these aquifers. And then a lot, of course, go down into the bedrock as well. But that's part of just trying to educate our community about where the water comes from. So now what we're hoping to do is map on top of this that contaminated plume. So then, then we can start maybe start understanding the directional flow, what future problems there might be from that. They haven't designated a source yet or a company that caused this contamination, so no cleanup has even begun yet. So we're still trying to encourage that. But that's what we've been learning is trying to educate the community about, you know, this is a great supply of water. We have a lot of uh, good uh, water, We've got good flow. It's hard, of course, lots of iron. We are, I've got a student right now working on a project to see if we can uh, map the iron levels throughout the county. Kind of tricky, of course, because you need to know the depth of, you know, the wells. And um, because it varies from... Um, 0.2 parts per million to seven parts per million iron in our county. And uh, I did hear one, uh, here, this map is a good one to show you where, uh, you know, herbicides, pesticides, Indiana's got a large concentration of that on our fields. I've got another student uh, looking into uh, glyphosate contamination. Iron bacteria, of course, is very common in our county. Um, so a lot of uh, education about that, how to deal with that problem. Um, you know, and that all bacteria isn't are bad. That's been one of my passions since we're a microbiology lab uh, to try to help people see that there are good bacteria too, and trying to understand the heterotrophic plate counts with uh, wells, not just the coliform issues. But manganese, uh, we're measuring that for people. Um, th this is talking about the, uh, the plume we have mapped on our Facebook page, and people can put in their address and see how far they are from that designated groundwater plume. So that's the way we're trying to educate is through that um, uh, map. This is arsenic results for the state of Indiana. This we're just beginning to start to understand and try to encourage people to do some arsenic testing since it's like popcorn around the state and um, just trying to encourage people. You know, we'll collect data as a private lab. It is just between us. This is a program I'm involved in. I would encourage any of you, if you have fifth to eighth graders, it's a UB the Chemist Challenge. They have free, uh, 
I know I've got that up here, but periodic tables for students. It's a competition like the spelling bee, but it's to learn how to uh, learn about the per uh, periodic table. Science fair projects, lots of, I've done um, fluoride variations with students, amoeba resistance to disinfection. One student won $1,000 with that project. So we just try to incorporate water into the science fair projects. Um, this is what we're doing as a business, trying to make it a, you know, a go, try to take in money, but also be a service to the community. So thank you for your time. Thank All right, so the next uh, speaker uh, is Jim Starbird from RCAP Solutions. He's based in Massachusetts, I know that much. And he's talking about uh, gathering information prior to a well assessment, which is a fun task, I tell you. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I wanted to use this topic because I felt as doing these well assessments, the more information I could gather prior to being on site with the homeowner, the more information I could give them whether it be about their well, the septic system, any other questions they might have had. So, you know, being prepared is uh, being the biggest thing. Um, a little bit of myself, I'm a program resource specialist for RCAP Solutions. I work in uh, the uh, Northeast branch of the RCAP network in Mass Connecticut and Rhode Island. I'm a former um, local public health sanitarian, so I feel that I've uh, worked on both sides of the, uh, of the fence. Um, a little bit on RCAP Solutions. We are, we are the North Face branch of um, the RCAP network. Our area is Maine to Pennsylvania. We also have some state-specific programs, uh, rental assistance programs. We missed that one. Okay, uh, community resources. We um, conduct well assessments for homeowners, uh, private well training, sanitarians, for, uh, sanitarians and homeowners. We also work with the state and local health departments to help promote uh, public, public health and private well um, initiatives. Uh, during a day job, we also do um, assist small water and wastewater systems through federal grants. Um, we also do trainings, water and wastewater operators, CEUs, and uh, trainings and technical assistance for wastewater boards and our staff. So on to the information. Um, the biggest things I like to gather prior to is the well logs, uh, septic records, local private well regulations, registry of deeds, um, USGS groundwater mo monitoring wells um, really came in handy last year with the uh, drought. God, I'm way behind. Okay, um, this time I'm going to focus on the well log. While water quality sampling information is sometimes in there, there's also other information on the well. Septic records as well gives me a lot of information as, as built, sometimes helps me locate the well. Um, but I work in three states, so gathering that information, three ways of doing business in each one of the states. So gathering that information is a challenge depending on what state I'm working in at the time. I'm actually still on that one. All right, so um, tri-state region, well assessments. Um, so each one has different primacy agencies, filing systems, requirements, contaminants, concerns, the license the well drill is, the permitting, uh, you name it, it's, each state does things a different way. So I'm gonna look over how this things. Uh, a little historical fact, Massachusetts is a, a home of the first health department in the U.S. in 1799 in Boston. It was formed to fight a cholera, uh, outbreak of cholera, so you could say it's the first drinking water primacy agency. And uh, a familiar name, Paul Revere, was the first health officer. Massachusetts, um, just like Pennsylvania, does not have a private well program, and we don't have statewide private well regulations. There's 351 boards of health, and each one of them has to adopt their own uh, regulations for wells. If they do not adopt them, there is no regulations. Uh, Massachusetts well logs would be found at the met, well, basically at the local boards of health. Um, Mass DEP's drill program does have some information, and the septic records really at the local board of health, their jurisdiction of them. Uh, Connecticut, they do have a private well program, um, and they also have a state drilling code, so there's actually a code to go after. And the permits and enforcement are done at the local level, at the local health departments or the regional health departments, whatever it might be. Uh, well logs, we need to find them. From 1970 to present, you'll find them at the Department of Consumer Protection. If it's 1952 and 1969, they'll be at the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. So you really gotta find out when the, when the well was drilled to even find the records. Rhode Island, they also have their own private well program and a state private well code, so everything is um, 
standardized, but the per and, uh, permits and enforcement are done by local building officials as opposed to health offices. Wall logs you would find at our RIDPH Private Well Program as well as the local um, building department, and septic records as well at the local building department. And uh, I just wanted to go over our different um, requirements in the next few slides, kind of give you a, an idea of each state. Massachusetts, well, each Board of Health makes their own regulations, so some, re some require new wells to be tested, some don't. Connecticut's only testing for new wells. Rhode Island does have it for occupancy permits prior to a new well and um, a changing of um, selling property. Uh, a couple of the setbacks, Massachusetts, 100 feet from a leach field. Connecticut is 75 feet, which is if it's under 10 gallons per minute, which usually I only see in public water system zone one, so um, it's different there. And, Oh, I'm already in the casing, oh well. <laughs> Casings, you can see it's different. Connecticut it being six inches, they recommend 12 to 24, but the code only requires it to be six. Massachusetts, again, doesn't have a code. I always go to the public water system. And I want to thank everyone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have uh, two more left. Uh, the next one is Cliff Trayans, who's with the National Groundwater Association. And, and uh, so Cliff, the NGWA is part of our uh, program, or part of a partner in our grant, and uh, so we've got to know each other pretty well over the last four or five years, so uh, Ian, it's all yours. Sorry. All right. Wait. Okay, thanks. So um, how data can improve well owner outreach effectiveness? I don't think I have to convince anybody here that that's important. But I think you're going to find some things maybe that are a little surprising. So uh, it's hard to lead someone when you can't see where you're going. And I'm thinking of the leaders being the programs and the followers being the well owners. Um, data can be very important in this, in this process of direction. Without sufficient data, many well owner outreach programs cannot, uh, don't lead with clear direction. Uh, there's all kinds of measurements that you can take, but some provide critical information to guide the direction of the program. So we did some research with CDC and found that most programs literally cannot demonstrate effectiveness in terms of mitigation of health risks. They don't have the data to do that. Uh, two key ma uh, data gaps I'm going to talk about are measuring reach into the audience, and then uh, measuring whether well owners uh, mitigate health risks. So these are two take-home points I, I hope people will remember from, from this presentation. NGWA interviewed 30 well owner outreach program managers to get qualitative information based on their experience, and then the Ohio State University College of Public Health did a search of relevant literature to give us more quantitative information. So question, what does it mean to measure audience reach? Uh, basically, measuring how many well owners are reaching the total target population, which means you have to know what the total target population is and then be able to measure against that with precision. Uh, question, why is measuring the audience reach important? How are you going to know what uh, uh, proportion of your well owner population you're reaching if you can't identify who they are and who you've reached? Um, it's common sense. Uh, why is it important to measure mitigation by well owners? Well, again, this is obvious, but um, mitigation is the ultimate measure of effectiveness. If we're doing all these things, but it's not changing behavior to mitigate risk, then what have we accomplished? Uh, question, why do more programs not measure audience reach or risk mitigation activity? Uh, we don't have clear answer to that. Uh, there's probably a multitude of reasons which some of you can probably uh, testify to. Um, so uh, anecdotal evidence suggests that the solutions to these two data gaps are simple conceptually, but not necessarily easy to execute. Silence. Um, some programs, uh, one, several programs compared property tax records to water utility records. They identified a residence on the property taxes, and then if they weren't on a water utility, there was a high probability they were a well owner. And so this gave them very precise information on the number of well owners and where they were located. So think about how useful that can be when you're trying to reach people. More silence. Um, 
Some programs uh, did, uh, we talked about follow-up to find out what actions they were taking, and so some programs did follow-ups at, at various intervals. I think we heard reference to one, two, three years out, but there needs to be follow-up to find out if they're, what their actions are to mitigate. And so uh, with needed staff and resources, programs can document uh, program success in reducing threats to human health. It is doable. These, these methodologies aren't hard. Um, but bottom line, a program cannot prove effectiveness if it cannot show how much of its target population it's reaching, uh, casting a wide net but not knowing what fish they're catching, and then uh, how many well owners in the target population have actually acted to mitigate the risk, which is the ultimate goal that I think all these programs are trying to reach. Uh, well owner outreach programs tend to measure activities, but not necessarily behavioral change resulting in actual risk mitigation. And this can often be a resource issue, just having the personnel to do it. So if your program is flying blind um, in that sense, consider these two key metrics to drive program improvement and health risk mitigation. You can improve your program if you know certain things aren't working and then, and then build on that. So I want to thank uh, the CDC for its support of our research and um, uh, thank you for listening and uh, I welcome your questions. Later. Okay, last but not least, uh, just so everyone knows Kelsey cheated. Um, we there said no rules. Uh, these were supposed to be 15 second slides. She went in and changed every slide so it's on a specific time. So, I've hit my five minutes. there you go. Anyway, it's, yeah, that's the other way to look at it. She's being resourceful. So, Kelsey Piper is really speaking for Adrian Cantor, couldn't be here, um, on examining resource needs for well users after flooding events. And Adrian's from Louisiana, mm -hmm. correct? Okay, yeah. He was oh, originally on it. Yeah. First slide. Oh, there you go. So hi everyone, I'm back. Um, so as Steve said, this is actually a project done by Dr. Adrian Katner at LSU, and this was done after the flooding event last summer in Louisiana. So summer 2016, there was a major flooding event really in the Baton Rouge area, and so we went in and looked at Livingston Parish, as Clay mentioned, that's county. So we looked at the county, which was one of the hardest hit areas by this flood. So just to give you an idea of um, what it looked like, well, it's, the area is inundated with water, Air, well, about 10 feet high with, for multiple days, and there was a lot of structural damage. And the water came in so quickly that people actually had to be evacuated out by boats. So Adrian and I started talking, and Adrian has a well, and she said, my well's been underwater for a couple days. Do I need to do anything? And so as people started coming home, we realized that, you know, we should be talking to them and telling people that they need to be concerned. Oh, this is not... Oh. My, my animation's not working. Anyways, the people need to be concerned about their well water and being considering that. So we wrote to the NSF and received a rapid grant to provide free well water testing to the residents in Livingston Parish. We worked with the local sheriff and the churches to communicate our program and basically sat in a parking lot over a weekend and handed out kits. We were there about two months after residents started coming home. We were able to work with 113 well, well residents we did water quality testing, but what I'm going to talk to you about is our well survey, looking at resource needs. We asked them to fill out a four-page survey. And thing, we asked things like well water usage. And as we've seen, people like their well water, they assume it's safe. They were drinking and cooking with it. But then after the flood, about half our homeowners reported that there was either damage to their system or their, their septic system or their well. Not surprisingly, they switched over to bottled water. We saw a reduction in people thinking their water was safe. But what's really interesting, and I don't know if it's going to show up, is that, uh, oh, there you go, about 7% of, only 7% of our homeowners actually participated in well water testing. And this is problematic because we know, as Clay talked about, there are opportunities, so something's going on. So we asked them, why didn't you test? So before the flood, we found that most people weren't concerned. They didn't think it was an issue. Again, going back to, they didn't know where to go. But then after the flood, what we found was that they were concerned, and the main reason they were not participating was because they didn't know where to go. So there's an information, information gap. 
And then we saw this as with uh, treatment and maintenance as well, that people knew they wanted to do things, but they didn't know what to do. They weren't equipped with the knowledge. So we asked them, did anyone talk to you about well water contamination before the flood? And we really didn't see much response. And then we again followed up after and said, did you, anyone talk to you after? And we saw a little bit better response. We found people talking about people at shelters were information, FEMA, um, but really just most people didn't think they were getting a lot of information about their well water. So we looked at the outlets of where they were looking for this information. And the main source was the news, either television or radio, but they were looking towards the news and then looking at community members, family, friends, or community leaders. This was pretty consistent before and after the flood with the news being the primary source of information. There was a little bump in community members looking towards family and friends. And then the other interesting thing, just because we often rely a lot on online information, we found that during the flood, 70% of our residents had to evacuate for an average of eight days. When they returned, half didn't have power and half didn't have internet. So this really starts to get the concept if we're trying to do things online that they may not have access to that. So the four topics that homeowners told us that they want information on after a flooding event is where to get water quality testing, what type of treatment options are available, what are the potential health consequences, and then they wanted specific information about their wells, things you'd get from the well logs. So just keep in mind as we talk about this, this is, a, this is a study that was focused in Livingston Parish. It was a convenient sampling. We sat in a parking lot. But really, what we're trying to get across is that when we think about well users, they are looking to government agencies to extension for information. And government agencies and extension are providing that. But sometimes there's a disconnect. The information we're giving is not readily available to homeowners. So our group is trying to understand that and better link those two organizations, the homeowners and the resources. So we're doing this in routine and emergency settings. And the next step is working with different states to understand what organizations are working and what are their dissemination strategies and how do we better link those. So we're doing some surveys, looking at who's doing what in your state in terms of programming so we can better pair them and help with outreach efforts. So thank you for your time. I'm not sure the best way to handle this, but uh, questions? Who has, um, I guess, questions and for who would be the way to handle it. Go ahead. Come up to the mic. And if, yeah, I guess, uh, I don't know if we want the speakers to come up. I don't think we need them all to come up. No, all right. Go ahead. So, uh, Kevin from University of Wisconsin Extension. Uh, my question's for Cliff. Um, the, 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 the point about mitigating or, or surveying how many people have mitigated risks. Um, do you have examples, does NGWA have examples of good survey tools or survey questions that could be used that people like us could integrate into our, our program efforts? Well, we didn't actually get into that. We were mainly trying to determine from the experience of people who are running these programs whether or not, well, we're trying to find out what they were doing in the way of follow-up. And what we were finding was that very, very few uh, actually went out at all past the, them getting the result. And the ones that did, quite often, the few that did didn't go that far out. And we know it can sometimes take time. So that's about the extent of it. But it certainly suggests that maybe, it certainly suggests that maybe some additional uh, effort to try to come up with those models would be good and circulate that. I'll actually let me see if I can check some of that out, and if I find anything, I'll, I'll circulate it among the group. Any other questions? Yeah. All right. There you go. You get it there. Okay. You do that, and I'll hold this one. Okay. Kelsey. Uh, I'm Julie Connell from RCAC in California, and we had a record wet year and a record snowfall, and we're fixing to get it. So we flooded a little bit in the winter when it rained, and we're about to get it, you know, as soon as the snow melts. So what, what would you suggest for me to get in place ahead of time for these well owners? So we <laughs> so we actually worked with two states. We've worked in Louisiana, and actually we're working with North Carolina right now. And so we are starting to compare their uh, their approaches. What we saw happening in North Carolina was they actually did a lot of, they knew the hurricane was coming, so they had more time to prepare. So they purchased sampling kits, they advertised to the residents, 
to get this. It was on the local news. They got their materials ready. So when, you know, because even the health departments had to evacuate. But when everyone came back in, everything was in place ready to go. So that's one of the strategies we've seen working. I think this is kind of why we're doing it, is to see what people are doing and what has been successful. But that's kind of one example of what we've seen that has been successful, is getting stuff ready if beforehand you go in. And you have, you have a reliable funding source for that, right? As you're, you're a state agency? No, I'm just a researcher. Okay. Uh, no, so I'm, I'm actually partnering with Louisiana and North Carolina health departments to evaluate this as a researcher. Okay. North Carolina, um, our state lab donated free kits for bacteria for any well owner that was flooded. Um, I don't know where their funding source came other than just the goodness in their heart. Um, but I know, um, but North, uh, Louisiana definitely works with extension and did low cost testing that way. Okay, thank you. Yep. Next question. Shirley, oh, there we go, all right. Who's it for? No, no, who's, who's it? Where, where did Cindy end up? I don't. This one. Oh, hat standing in the back. That's like I couldn't find it. So, did you ever open the 1945 sealed well? No, we, did, we have not, and the owner hasn't. The last that I spoke with us. And I guess that's like a real question because we run into a lot of these wells too. Is it better to just not look inside and open them? I mean, how much vulnerability <laughs> and how much damage are you going to do to the well as opposed to just putting a treatment system on for the problem? Since that homeowner had children in the home, I recommended that they do open it because there may be disinfection that is needed. They did have quite an extensive uh, treatment system in the home, um, and they have replaced some of the plumbing just outside of the home. So the question, the other question was, is how much longer is that pump going to last? I can't, I just can't imagine that it hasn't been unsealed since 1945 with, with pump issues. Um, so I did recommend that maybe they have a well driller come out and open the well, evaluate the pump and even service it or replace it. Um, do some, maybe do some disinfection if necessary, but otherwise at least look at, look the pump over to make sure that they weren't going to be left in a lurch with three children in the home. This is Frida, Minnesota State Health Department. My question's for Ginger, and I don't know where you ended up. I just, could you provide a little bit more information? So you create this beautiful report for private well users, and then how do you deliver it? to them, is it digital or is it mailed to them? Is it to every person who ever tests or do they get to self-select for this additional service? So um, this is a very new program. Um, I'm very new to the position um, and it's something my board has asked me to bring to the position coming from my background. Um, so far we are actually going out to their homes afterwards with a hard copy of the report so that they can put that in their record file. Uh, we, we work with Cindy, so she provides, we've, we talk to them ahead of time, but she provides me the assessment and then I build on that assessment and, and basically give them a folder that they can contain all the reports and testing results and everything so that they have that document um, available for the next owner or their children or whoever ends up getting that, that property with that well on it afterwards. I'm still walking, still walking, okay. I have a question for Jesse. Where's Jesse? Hi, Jesse. Um, you mentioned um, <clears throat> being able to detect the direction of coliform movement. Can you talk a little bit more about um, that? Not really being able to detect it, but being able to hypothesize where it was coming from. Just based um, on the location in, of sources of? Yeah, in order to detect it, that was why it was a hypothesis in the end, because mm -hmm. nobody wanted to spend all the money to have a nice groundwater hydrologist like Steve come out and drill right. a bunch of test holes and try to figure out what direction the water's moving and all that. So in the end, we weren't able to give them all the answers, but we were at least able to identify some of the possible causes in the area. Okay. And uh, since they do zoning and planning as well, the sanitarian is also the zoning and planning lady. She's just going to zone and plan that area out to have deeper wells that are grouted deeper and avoid that aquifer from now on. So I've kind of followed up with her a little bit to oh, okay. see what's going on with it. All right, thanks. Didn't, didn't you also say that the ponds were new? Yeah, the, the ponds are new. So, so basically what, what he'd done is he dammed up that entire watershed on that side, which typically diverted the water around the outside. and 
and dug them out, dammed them up, and then drilled himself a nice well to fill the ponds with as the ponds went dry down into the aquifer. And that was continuous. They just continuously fed, filled the ponds like a golf course. So, Any other questions? Who, who's, who are you asking? I give this to the speaker, not to you. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah, you have to go up there. Oh. You can do that. Who's the, who are you asking to? Cliff? Oh, OK. This is an acetic. So, so this is a question for Cliff, and I'm going to ask one, and then I'm going to give something. So uh, the question is, when you, um, when you interviewed people about um, uh, collecting the data to determine where the wells were and where the public water intersected using tax records and the, the PUC data, the mm -hmm. public water, public utility data, mm -hmm. um, just, I'm just not familiar. Is the public utility data readily available electronically, or is they, do they consider their client list proprietary? Is there a way to get that? I'm not sure I know the answer to that. Uh, I mean, there, these were several specific programs, and I, I, did, I don't know their exact methodology for doing it. And so when I say something's uh, simple, but it's not easy, part of the not easy thing may be working out whatever kind of uh, cooperation is necessary to share those records. But I, I don't know exactly what methodologies those two programs in particular use that same, or actually three, use that same approach. But they were all able to co get, cooperate with the utility to get those records, yeah. And, and we participated as one of your um, survey people, so I know you can't share that information, but I'll share it. Okay. Um, Allison McCann has an, have from the University of Rhode Island Extension has an excellent post-survey uh, on mitigating risks, and I'd be happy to share those questions um, with anybody who wants them. Thank you. I would think it'd matter whether it's a public utility in the community or versus like here it's Illinois American, they're a private entity, and some of that's probably more of a pain, the bottom line. I would assume if it's public, it's, it's a little easier. It's accessible. Any other questions? So my question is also for speakers from Kansas. Could somebody speak to uh, the effectiveness of disinfecting a well that's under the influence of surface water? best method of disinfecting a well under the influence of ground surface water would be you wouldn't really disinfect the well. The well is always going to be under the influence of surface water. Um, at that point in time, one of the recommendations I gave back to all the well owners is just coliform. Obviously, it's not deadly to them. But since you have surface contamination present, everything else that might come with surface contamination might show up at any time. So that was one of the recommendations that I gave them was you may want to do additional testing. Um, you may also have to add treatment for bacteria just to cover everything because it may not be there today and it may be there tomorrow because you just don't know, um, especially when you're under the influence of surface water. So, uh, and, and another thing is we don't know if this is going to occur in dry years or not. I mean, obviously it'd be something great to follow up on and see if it's just because it was a really wet year and the aquifer was recharging and that pond happened to be recycling more often or something like that. So not for sure on that. but. As for disinfecting a well that's under the influence, I'd say no. I'd say you're going to have to add treatment regardless, just like a city would when they build their municipal wells down in the bottoms. So, Yeah, the same thing with Tuscarora in that area. They have a lot of bacteria contamination. The only solution really was uh, to add continuous treatment, whether it's chlorine or UV, just because uh, it's septic contamination and it's always going to be there. Uh, hi, I'm Candy from RCAP in uh, New York, and this question is for Jason from Mississippi. And my question is about um, the poultry farming that you were talking about, a lot of poultry farms, and how even though arsenic's been banned from poultry foods since, I think, 2015 or 2013, if anybody was tracking arsenic contamination as a result of poultry farming, and if they're tracking it since then in terms of reduction in arsenic because of the ban on arsenic and chicken food. Your question is directed toward arsenic, and we have done zero in relation to arsenic. Uh, our biggest, um, I guess, effort with that publication was more in the placement and sizing of wells to supply, uh, because one of the issues we were seeing, uh, location of the well in proximity to the houses, uh, for one, you're seeing people that would that would also expand their farms, and then they realize they don't have a large enough supply. They didn't put in large enough lines. 
Uh, so we were looking more or less from the sizing and placement and not uh, contaminants. That's actually something we're starting to look at now. It's a great question, but I don't have an answer for you. Well, well, thanks. Maybe, you know, I'd ask this generally to people who are involved in arsenic research and in places where there is a lot of poultry farming, if anybody can answer that, because uh, it always um, disturbed me, to say the least, and, I, and I'm relieved to know that the, it's banned, but um, I'm curious if anybody's tracking um, the decrease in arsenic as a result of that ban. So I can make a comment. Um, Keith Knockman at Johns Hopkins has done research on that. And I think he has some available on the web, some of the reports that he's done and some recent work that he's published. So that would be a resource I would recommend looking at. And I can send that to you, Candy. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? Caitlin, I'm with the um, Michigan State Health Department. Um, this is maybe a question for Kelsey. Uh, it might be more of just a thought. Um, have you given any consideration uh, increased flooding due to climate change and what we can do to kind of prepare for that? <laughs> That's a loaded question. <laughs> That's the big one in the room, isn't it? Yeah. I don't personally do anything with that. My colleague, Adrian Katner, does. Um, and I, I think anyone probably in Louisiana can probably talk to you about the increased flooding because um, I think that was their second, and guys correct me if I'm wrong, but second big flood of the year that they were not expecting. But so I know that if you want, like Adrian would be a great person to talk to. Oh yeah, it doesn't exist. <laughs> well, I think everyone needs to be practical about it and realize that in the climate we have today, we can't really talk about climate change, but we can certainly talk about droughts and floods and warmer temperatures, right? So talk about what the results are. I was just curious, Lisa, if you have any um, estimate about uh, what the actual percentage and decrease of call volume was through your this continuous improvement project. Uh, we don't have any numbers because we don't have our staff spend the time tracking how many calls they get because that takes away from time doing inspection. But I was thinking a lot about it when Cliff gave his talk about, well, how can we, you know, we just really are only anecdotally measuring the improvement. It would be nice if we could do it with data. Yeah. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right. Well, that went well. I'm, uh... <laughs> Thank you.